So first of all, thank you very much for the audience and giving the talk about hacker ethics. Uh, probably it's a little bit unusual. Um, but nonetheless, as you, as you hear, my talk will be in English. I will try to speak not too fast. If I do, please give me a sign and I will slow down again. Uh, and if you have a question, please interrupt me immediately. Don't wait until the end of the talk. Uh, because then we all have forgotten the context of your question, so please ask as soon as you can. Um, I've been joining the hacker community in Germany quite a while ago. It's more than 25 years ago actually now. Uh, so I've been a member of the Case Computer Club since the mid-80s. Uh, the Case Computer Club is one of the first and still the largest uh, group of uh, association of hackers worldwide, I think. Uh, so we have a very long tradition uh, 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 of doing hacker things. And as most of the hackers I joined because I was interested in the technical aspects of hacking. Uh, but very soon I learned that hacking is much more than just thinking about how to break into computers or how to write funny programs. Uh, that computers actually have a social impact. Uh, and that we have to think about this as hackers as well. Uh, and this leads to some, in some ways, to what we call the hacker ethics. Um, in the 1980s, when, when I joined the Case Computer Club, uh, computers in the hand of the common people was quite unusual. Most of the people have never even heard about computers. Uh, so there were very few hackers. And that way we were very interesting for the media. So we were often asked, uh, uh, what is a hacker? And of course you can give the standard answer of what a hacker is, as a person who do things playfully clever, and even without computers. But of course that's not sufficient for the press, they want to know more. So we used the hacker ethics uh, to explain what hacking is about, what hackers want to achieve and what they want to do. So this ethics is not just about describing how hackers should behave. It's always also something that we want, that we as hackers want the others to see us. So to learn about us, how do hackers tick, what do they think, how do they work? Um, in, 19, in, in 2001, Bau Holland, one of the founders of the KS Computer Club, died. And so five of his closest friends founded a foundation, which is called the Bau Holland Foundation. Uh, and we are closely associated, of course, with the KS Computer Club, uh, but take care about these non-technical issues of hacking. So we are very interested in the social aspects of hacking and computer usage. Uh, maybe some of you have heard about the foundation, of course, we have been the main financial backer of WikiLeaks for the last years, uh, and are supporting projects like Tor uh, and other projects to enhance your information rights in the society, so we feel ourselves to be a civil right foundation. So I gave this talk quite often to, to non-hackers actually, so this is a world premiere in a sense, because I'm not only talking about the hacker ethics that we had since the middle of the 1980s, I will also talk about what we as a foundation are discussing about the hacker ethics 2.0, because 30 years ago, things were completely different. As I said, computers were not usual. Most of the people never had a computer contact before. And they all called us crazy because we said there will be a day when nearly everyone has a computer. When these computers will be connected to a network like the telephones. And computers will be used by the people not to compute something, but to communicate. And they said, you are simply crazy, this will never happen, a computer is to, to do number crunching, what has that to do with communication? But as you will see, it has a lot to do with communication. So, the situation in the last 30 years has changed, and hackers are no longer simple hackers. Uh, so hackers nowadays come in different flavors, and one of the flavors you probably all heard about is, are the black hat hackers. The black hat hackers are, are these people, you can say, they are on the dark side of the force. They do 
basically criminal things, very often for to, for gaining personal profit. So it's a commercial, basically it's a commercial orientated thing, and they do not share their secrets with everyone. They keep their secrets for themselves to profit to profit on them. And then of course there is not only the black hat hacker, there always is the white hat hacker. Mm -hmm. These are guys that are basically doing the same thing, but they're doing it out of a different motivation. They also are often commercially oriented, but on a legal basis. So they try to hack into computers to find computer security holes and help the manufacturers to fix that and get money for it. So they are commercially oriented and they do hacking as a job. Does any one of you know how these distinctions between white hat hackers and black hat hackers, where they, where they come from, where does it originate? It's the Western movies, the Hollywood Western movies in the early 30s of the last century. So the producers decided it would be a good idea if everyone who sees these Western movies knows immediately who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. So in these Western movies, the bad guys always wear a black hat and the good guys always wear a white hat. So this distinction from the Western movies has been applied to hackers as well. And when I talk to non-hackers, I always ask, do you know of another flavor of hackers? And believe it or not, most of them say, yeah, red hat hackers. <laughs> Which of course is a, is, a, is a nonsense, because red hat, of course, is not not a flavor of hacking, it's a, it's a brand, uh, it's a, it's a, dis, a Linux distribution, a commercial one. But there is a third flavor of hacking, and that's the gray hats. And the case computer club hackers and the people associated with the case computer club may basically always felt associated to what we call the gray hats. It's the ethical hacktivism of that drives them. It's, it's using their knowledge not just to, to do the technical things, uh, but to, to use this knowledge and uh, to spread the knowledge about how computers change society and what's good and what's bad. So the gray hats not only say we are non-commercial, we do not hack for money. They always also say we have an ethical guideline what to do and how to do it and why to do it. This sounds funny because what has hacking to do with ethical behavior? Most people say there's no, that has nothing to do with each other. With each other, and one of these guys who said that is Richard Stallman, which is a very prominent person uh, in, in the open source society. He says no, hacking has nothing to do with ethics. But I do not agree. And for the case of computer club, of course, there is a very special relationship to ethics. Of course, the Case Computer Club was founded in 1981, and three years afterwards, it published a book which was called the Hacker Bible. And of course, the Hacker Bible must contain an ethics. So the Hacker Ethics was basically uh, first introduced in the Hacker Bible, uh, released in the, in the New Testament, so to speak, in 1988, where we described uh, how we think about ethical behavior. And the point is that we did not come up with all the ethical points ourselves. I will introduce you to these eight points uh, right now. Uh, we didn't invent them. There was a book in 1984 by an American author called Stephen Levy. And he wrote a book that's called Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution, where he uh, visited a lot of guys who were involved in the hacker movement in America since the 1860s. So the old school hackers at the MIT, uh, to the guys who do game programming for Sierra. So he visited a lot of different kinds of hackers um, and came up with six points of a hacker ethics. They said, from all I've learned from talking to these people, these are their common guidelines. These are their common belief system. And he wrote it down and he took these six points uh, uh, something that we want to have in our hacker ethics as well and added two points, two more points. 
So just let me introduce to these eight points of the hacker ethics. The first and most important one is that access to computers and everything that might explain how this world works must be unlimited and total. Which means that no one has the right to prevent other people from learning about how this world works. And in this sense, the Wikipedia, which was founded in 2001, is exactly an expression of this point in hacker ethics. It's an open and free and a community-based encyclopedia of how the world works and how the world is and what you know, what you need to know as facts about this world. And interesting enough, as I said before, hacking does not necessarily has to do something with computers. It's something about doing things a little bit different, doing them playfully clever. There have been two hackers some 250 years before the Wikipedia that did exactly the same thing. And they published the so-called Encyclopedia. And these two guys were called Diderot and Donalbert. They were French people who basically made their task to collect all the knowledge of the world at that time and to put it into a book. And there are two more very interesting correlations between Wikipedia uh, and the old, old encyclopedia from Diderot and Donalbert. First of all, Wikipedia is based on a tool which is called a media wiki. And this media wiki is an open source thing that everyone can use to create his own encyclopedia for his field of knowledge or for his domain or for whatever he thinks he can use it for. And the printed encyclopedia not starts with the letter A to explain the first words related to, to the letter A. No, it started with how to build a printing machine to copy this book. So how to distribute the not not just to distribute the knowledge, but to spread it in a complete way. So you can, can actually produce your own copy of the encyclopedia. So as I said, hacking has nothing to do with computers. These two people were certainly hackers. But we of course go a little step further. We say not not just the information about how the world works should be free. No, all information should be free. And this comes from a, from a, from a quote that's Stuart Brand. I don't want to talk to about Stuart Brand too much, but probably some of them, some of you know him, know him because he published a book called The Whole Earth Catalog. Uh, it's a big, big thing where you can order books and tools and stuff. Uh, that you can normally not order uh, on a normal, in a normal shop or in a normal bookstore in the early 70s and 80s of the last century. And he wrote, okay, information wants to be free because it's so damn easy to copy information and shared information is double information because you can copy it without damaging the original basically. So it's easy to, to, to reproduce, to replicate information as much as possible. On the other hand, information wants to be very, very expensive because information in the right hands, in the right context, can be an enormous advantage for, for the one who has this information in his hand. And this, he said, this tension will never go away. And actually that's what we, what we see today. Because we are now talking about patents, we are talking about ACTA, we are talking about freedom of information. This tension is actually expressed in this, in this uh, quote. But for us as hackers, we only take the first part that says information not wants to be free, but should be free. And as the hacker community takes this takes this as their guideline, they of course develop uh, a behavior system, basically, or a license system in this case, where they, where they publish their work according to this ethical guideline that all information should be free. So coders and, and people who do programming 
can, can distribute and publish their work in an open source or a free and open source uh, 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 license. And if you do creative work, media and stuff, uh, there's the Creative Commons license to share your work with the world with the other people. The next very important point in the hacker ethics from the 1980s is to mistrust authority and to promote decentralization. So whenever a system starts to focus on centralization, that there are a few people deciding for everyone else. That's the beginning of the end. And uh, the, the case Computer Club took that serious from the very beginning. So there has never been a real central point of the case Computer Club, although it was in Hamburg and Berlin as, as a registered association. But there have been a lot of places in Germany all the time where people meet locally and promote their local ideas and do their local stuff. But they feel all associated with the case Computer Club as, as an idea, but not with the centralization, but as a local thing. So we actually, and I'm currently living in Switzerland, so we are actually doing that in Switzerland as well. So we have different places in Switzerland uh, where local chapters of the case Computer Club are existing, they do their, their local stuff. Uh, we have common interests and we do these things together uh, to promote our ideas. The next thing is that hackers at that time, and you must see this, this guideline in the context of its time, that hackers at that time were the real nerds. I mean, they're still called nerds and geeks and stuff, but at that time they were real nerds. I mean, they were real outsiders. Nowadays, when people use the term nerd or geek, I mean, it's always a little bit admiration as well, because they think, hey, these guys know how to handle the technology we use every day. But at that time, hackers were using a technology nobody was using. I mean, they didn't have computers, so they were real outsiders. Uh, so hackers came up with the saying, we want to be judged by what we do not by these common criteria people normally categorize people. And what we want others to do for ourselves, we do for the others as well. So we will not judge people by these criteria as well, but only by what they are doing. And now there are two more funny, funny and very unusual points in these old, old hacker ethics, uh, which are sometimes hard to explain in the first place, which said you can create art and, art and beauty on a computer. I mean, at that time it was very unusual because computers were used to compute something or to control something. Uh, but art, what's that? So the case Computer Club always has projects to promote these ideas as well, that you can do very interesting, funny, artful things with the computer as well. What you see here, is the so-called project blinking lights, uh, where you have a building with a lot of windows. Basically, the, the more windows, the better. And the closer the windows together, the better. And this is the opening of the French National Library, which took place in 2002. And behind each of the windows is a, is a light, which you can, can control in its intensity. Uh, and there's a computer system to control all the windows. So you can play, you can display uh, images, you can play movies, uh, you can even do inter interactive games. So there's actually a ping pong game where two people with a cell phone can play ping pong uh, against each other on these facades. So as you see, art is always, can always be a part of computing as well. And computers can change your life for the better. This is one of the sentences which is definitely related to, to or is, is based on the fact that uh, Stephen Levy, when he wrote his book about hackers, met a lot of people uh, who really get a grip on their own life because they work with computers. I mean, this is a very, very personal experience, and it's, I mean, it's part of the original hacker ethics, but it's, it's even for me, it's, 
nothing I would actually put into the hacker ethics, and as we will see, the new hacker ethics will drop this point. Okay, and then when the CCC said, okay, these are the six points from Stuart Brand, let's think about what we want to add, and we added two points in the, in the 80s, in the late 80s, uh, to these hacker ethics, and the, they, these are based on our personal experiences. I mean, the Case Computer Club has been well known for its, for its hacks as well, not for its hacker effects, but for the hacks it did. Uh, you probably heard of uh, the people from the Case Computer Club breaking into uh, the BTX system, or not breaking, exploiting failures in the BTX system uh, to withdraw 135,000 Deutschmarks from, from the bank. Uh, which made them probably famous overnight in 1984. Uh, and there were a lot of other hacks as well, which culminated in the hacks into the Nava computers uh, and into the story of the people who actually did spying for the KGB. From the people related to the case of the Club, thought it is a good idea. Yes? Karl Koch. Sorry? Uh, Karl Koch. That's exactly the story of Karl Koch. Did you know him? I met him, yes, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, just, just to explain, I mean, it sounds funny. No, it does not sound funny. It sounds very unbelievable that hackers can decide to actually spy for, for, a, for, a, uh, um, for a secret service, and especially probably for a secret service of a foreign country like the KGB from Russia. Um, just to explain what they, why they did it, I mean, I talked to them and they explained why they did it. They said, we, we had the impression that, that there is an imbalance between the Western world and the Eastern world in terms of technology. And this imbalance can only lead to, to a confrontation. Uh, so the only way to prevent war is by giving the Eastern countries the same technology as the Western countries has. So they, there's a balance again, and then there's no reason for war anymore. At least not in that area. I mean, uh, as you probably know, the Western countries were not allowed to export technology, computer technology, especially uh, to the Eastern countries. So they did it for that reason. They did not do it uh, because spying is, a, is an interesting thing. They did, really did it for their own beliefs which doesn't make it better, but uh, at least it's understandable why they do it, did it. So, um, during these, these hacks, uh, you were always in a position where you can, can mess with other people's data. I mean, you break into a computer, you, you travel around in the computer networks at that time, uh, and you always can have the temptation to just change something or to delete something, or to take it away and delete it. And for us it was obvious that's not a good idea. I mean, it's not, it's not morally sound. So, we said there must be a rule to say don't map with other people's data. You can move in the network as freely as you want, but respect the data of other people. And the most important point that was added in the end of the 1980s was the sentence, Publi utilize public information, but protect private information. Uh, this point of the hacker ethics actually became the pillars of the Case Computer Club for the 20 years to come. Because Utilizing public information is just an expression for freedom of information. I mean, it means use the information that is available in the public or which should be available in the public. It also says all the data that is assembled in the public must be accessible by everyone. There must be a freedom of information. Who decides that? Which should, uh, what should be public and what should there could be, not be? There can be very easy criteria. You can say every information that is, for example, created or financed by the public 
So if we, for example, as a, as a community, finance the university, so every result that is produced in the university, whatever it is, must be publicly accessible. Uh, then there are re then there are areas where you can say where it relates to the public. That's very hard to to uh, uh, to make a decision sometimes. But let's say you are you are uh, uh, you are running a plant and you are using the river water to do some cooling or whatever, and you put the water back. Then every information of what you, of what pollutants, for example, you put into the river, must be public information because it relates to the public. It's no longer just a matter for you; it's a matter for the for the for the society. I agree. Sometimes it's hard to decide, and there is no judge to decide that. And sometimes you have to make your decisions based on your belief system. Protecting private information is something which we call in Germany informational self-determination. And that term has now come into, into the juristic speech speak uh, in Europe. Uh, it simply says you as a person are the sovereign of your data. No one except you can decide what with your data, what should happen with your data, or what can happen to your data. It's only you. So, we started to think about a new hacker ethics. We said there are some good points in the, in the old hacker ethics, but there are some points missing. So let's see what can we do to make a new hacker ethics. And informational self-determination, as I said, which is the sovereignty over your own data, is certainly one of the most important points. And sometimes saying, okay, you have the right to control your own data, just is not enough. Sometimes you have to actually exercise this rights actively. You can't rely on the others to respect your rights. So you need to, you need some means to enforce your rights if necessary. And one of these rights we think you can use, therefore, is cryptography. We think cryptography is one of the utilitarian <coughs> tools. Uh, to enforce your own right. So if you don't want other people to use your data, encrypt them. And do not accept that anyone wants to prevent you from encrypting your stuff. Use public and open source uh, software to do this encryption, which is available, of course, uh, so that you can enforce your right. This, of course, has also political impl implications because if you are the owner of your data then no one can actually do with the data what they want and it's often the state of the government who wants to do with your data what they think is necessary or not. And also very important, if you have the right about your own, over your own data, so if you move in a public space like the internet you must have the right to stay anonymous. It's your decision when you show up as, as a person and say, I am whoever I am. It's your right to decide when this point has come. No one else can take, you, can take away those rights from you. So anonymity is a very important thing. It's your decision whether you want to be anonymous or not. Of course, freedom of information will also be in the new, in the new hacker ethics. And freedom of information acts or transparency laws are just the beginning. It's just setting a legal framework uh, for freedom of information. Uh, most countries nowadays have something like a freedom of information act, and it usually works like this: everything is secret. Every document the government produces is secret, except you ask for it and can argue for what you, why you want to have it and what the document number is called and stuff like that, then you can ask for this information. And then there are rules if they have to process and then they can decide if you're, if you're really eligible to get this information or if there are reasons you can't get this information. 
To give you an example, Freedom of Information Act is existent in America since 1974, I think. Uh, and you can even get documents if you are under surveillance by uh, the FBI, for example. So, uh, John Weiss, in one point in time, uh, asked, based on the Freedom of Information Act, for her surveillance documents, documents that were collected and generated during the surveillance of her. And she gave basically everything with just 10 pages blacked out where the names of informants uh, were, were listed. So just to protect their personal rights. But she got everything. But it was not said to her. They didn't say, well, we surveilled you, so here are the documents we learned about you. You have to ask for it. And therefore, we do not enforce, uh, we don't want to have Freedom of Information Act in that way. We want transparency laws. And transparency laws basically work the other way around. Transparency laws means the government has to publish everything and they have to argue for each and every single document they don't want to publish. They have to say why this document cannot be published. But you, it's no need for you to ask for the document. No, they are there already. Everything must be public. And you think that's funny, that will never happen? Tell you, tell, tell you what. Uh, the hackers from the Case Computer Club in Hamburg started together with other groups uh, to write a law for Hamburg. And actually, this law came into, was accepted by the Hamburg uh, 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 Council. And it came uh, uh, as, a, as a law some four or five months ago. So that's valid from uh, from the uh, 1st of January this year. So Hamburg is actually now working exactly that way. The, the official places in Hamburg have to publish documents in advance. They have to follow this transparency law. Then, of course, the access to to public data should be in a standard way. I mean, they can publish it somewhere in a, in a very weird format and, and say, yeah, we published it, it's, it's available. If you can't work with it, your problem uh, can't be. So there must be a standard way to access this, this public information as well. Uh, there is a worldwide initiative which is called Open Data. Uh, there's an Open Data initiative and this is trying to to formulate ways on how this information should be presented so you can actually even automatically process this public information. A very important part of freedom of information, of course, is the topic censorship. And active and passive censorship is basically no difference. The result is always the same. It means you cannot access certain information because someone decides that you are not allowed to read this information for whatever reasons. And we as the hacker community should oppose all attempts of censorship on information worldwide. Okay, so we took these two points from the previous hacker ethics and said, okay, that's important to have, but is that all? No, it's not. We are missing very important things here. And these important things are what we call freedom of communication. Uh, it's not just the freedom of information that means access to information, but also of communication. Because we still think that the computer is the main tool to promote communication between people. I mean, the most visited websites uh, on the web are still pages like Facebook, where people communicate with, with each other. It's not, it's not any, any company website, no, it's this website where people communicate. So we need rules and, and guidelines for freedom of communication as well. Uh, we need something to express respect and responsibility, I will explain in detail what that means. And we should take, take care of the issue of caring and sharing, because we as hackers are not living alone in this world. We are sharing this world with a lot of other people, and we should think about how we should relate to other people. 
Okay, freedom of communication sounds so easy. It's, it just means uh, you have the right to free and unhampered communication worldwide. Uh, in, the, in the Western world, this right has been evolved over a long time. And it's basically now something we take for granted. But there are so many other countries in the world where this right is not available to people. And we as the, as the hackers, I had to explain communication, of course, as in the 1980s, it had always something to do with the postal service. I mean, at, at that time, the ways to communicate were via telephone or via mail. I mean, not email, I mean snail mail. I mean the real mail, right, with your hand. Um, so that was all under the control of the postal service. And we always had our fights with the postal service in, in Germany at that time. That was actually uh, something something really famous uh, for the German hackers. Um, so, Frau said, there are, we do not have a clash with the postal service as a postal service. We have a clash with people within the postal service because there are two traditions uh, 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 of postal service and one is based um, on a guy called Heinrich von Stefan. He founded the UTU, that is the Universal, UPU, the Universal Postal, uh, I forgot the last thing, but it's now it's a UN uh, uh, thing, so it's it's the Weltpost Verein. It controls how the different countries uh, work together for distributing mails, not emails, mails. Uh, and he was, at that time, I mean, that was in 1871 when he founded uh, uh, this thing. That was the time when France and Germany were at war with each other. And his organization made sure that people in France and in Germany can exchange letters, even their countries were at war with each other. So even if, if countries have problems with each other, the people should be able and have the right to communicate with each other and exchange each other with each other. And the other tradition of the post system is uh, Leopold von Taxis. He bought the right to distribute mail from the German emperor. Uh, and the first thing he did was collecting all the mail that was sent. I mean, at that time it wasn't much, but he collected everything, opened it, read it, uh, and made a list who is communicating with whom, about what. And this list went to the emperor every month. So the emperor know, knew exactly uh, uh, how the people who were able to read and write emails, uh, emails uh, actually thought and what they were doing. So that's the tradition of the postal system we want to fight. And we want to support the postal tradition of Heinrich von Stefan, which says free and unlimited communication between people. Respect and responsibility means that if we claim rights in the information age for ourselves, we must respect the information rights as others as well, just as we respect our own. And it means also that in this case we have to educate others about their rights, because probably they don't even know about their rights. They probably don't even know they should have a right uh, to freely communicate, to stay anonymous, whatever. So we need to educate people about that. And sometimes people are not able to exercise their right. I mean, to have a right is a good thing. But if you're not able to exercise your right, it's worthless. I mean, it's like you do not have it. So we must help other people to exercise their information rights as well. Just and especially if they can't do it for themselves. And that's what we call respect and responsibility in the information age, especially for us as hackers. Caring and sharing, of course, that's easy. I mean, I, uh, the, the two most important points were already on the list. Uh, so to say, if you are a programmer, if you are a coder, share your, share your work with others under uh, a free and open source software license. And if you are creative, if you're doing creative works, share your works under the Creative Commons license with others. 
so that everyone can benefit from your work. And share your knowledge with everyone. Do not think you, just because you know something someone else doesn't know, that you are a better person. You are not. You are a better person if you share your knowledge with the persons who don't know that. And this is especially true for kids, we think. So we as a foundation, for example, are actually financing projects to help kids understand computer technology and their impact on society better. So, especially kids. Now I take it all together. So, just to, to display the Hacker Ethics 2.0, what we think can be the Hacker Ethics 2.0 in a draft version. So this is basically all the points we've been talking about. Um, and this is a draft. So it's not, not a solid end result. We are in a discussion about it. And as I said, this is the world premiere. Uh, we haven't talked about this in public ever before. This is the very first time we do that. And uh, in the coming month, we will distribute that on the uh, mailing list for the, for the case groups. Uh, and we'll start a discussion on the new hacker ethics. And maybe come to some kind of conclusion at the end of the year. So we'll have a new, probably a new hacker ethics for the next case communication congress in Hamburg in 2013. And I think these, these points cover pretty well all the points we as hackers are basically concerned with. And to show you that, I go one step forward, I will come back to, to this one. Um, this is about the groups we had. We had information and self-determination, we have freedom of communication, freedom of information, caring and sharing. And I will now place all the topics we are concerned with and we are working with into these these graphics. Um, I will not go through every, every single one, uh, but as you see, and if you, if you read the, the, the topics, this is something the hackers are working on, one way or another. I mean, they work on, uh, they work on cryptography and privacy issues, they work on digital direct actions, they work on these shared licenses. Uh, the term, this is probably interesting because you certainly never heard about it, we call teaching young kids about computers and computer technology and their impact on society, we call it alphabetization. <laughs> so, um, it's like, like learning to read and write. Uh, it's not alphabetization, it's alphabetization because we think knowing about these things is basically a culture technology. Just like reading, writing, calculating, uh, nowadays it's a culture technique. Um, we want, of course, we want to support open, open government, open data uh, things. Of course, hacker spaces, of course, they are uh, the interconnection between freedom of communication and freedom of information, creating places where people can meet and share their ideas and knowledge and where people uh, basically can, can do all these other things as well uh, we have on this list. Oh, I wasn't, wasn't ready. Because there is, uh, of course, now we start all green points. Green points means uh, points we agree with. This is something positive. But of course, uh, the world is not not a nice place to live in, not in every circumstance. So there are always issues uh, we have to fight as well, not just to promote, but to fight as well. Uh, and these things fit into these, into these circles as well. So we, we don't want patterns. We don't want people to, to, to hinder you to access knowledge about the world. No one has the right to do that. We don't want, we don't want censorship. We don't, law, don't want lawful interception, people spying on you without reason. You have done nothing right, but, but governments today think they have the right to spy on you nonetheless. Record all your conversations, record all your communication uh, parameters. That's, that's not a good thing. We don't want that. 
data retention and, and storing that information for six months and longer. I mean, no, we don't want that. Okay, so this is all based on uh, uh, the Hacker Ethics 2.0 we think should become. Should we, we should update the old Hacker Ethics from the late 80s. I mean, it's 30 years, 25 years old. I think it needs, it needs, it needs new, new ideas. And especially it need your ideas. So if you have anything you think that's missing, if you have any comments, please go ahead and tell me. Thank you very much. that uh, you are so uh, detail-oriented, you know. Uh, it, it is uh, really, uh, your, your lecture is uh, very safe, perhaps too safe for the real world, where uh, people usually discuss the power of technology that has become uh, rather, uh, 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 rather great uh, in size, uh, sizable. Uh, so uh, recently uh, we uh, saw the movie about the founders of the Pirate Bay. It just came out, it's a short documentary, uh, and uh, in short, everybody got arrested. Uh, so maybe uh, you would like to uh, make a comment about the issue of uh, BitTorrent uh, and, and the piracy and uh, the, the, the power of technology. That, that seems to overwhelm us, uh, that seems to overwhelm us uh, uh, in a way, even though it is helpful, but it is also uh, coming at us, bringing us some uh, problems, perhaps. <laughs> I mean, good, good point. I mean, uh, the question here is if it's, if it's in the first place overwhelming us, or if it's overwhelming the people currently in power. Uh, I mean, Pirate Bay, the founders of Pirate Bay is a good example, but my friend Julian Assange is another good example of uh, being in, a, in the Ecuadorian embassy for more than nine months, basically. Uh, so, doing the things we think are correct and should be done because we are hackers can bring us in conflict with the existing powers. No question about it. And the hacker ethics, from my point of view, should be a moral guideline to decide what kind of compromises are we going to make to prevent this kind of trouble. I mean, it's, it's a question that everyone has to answer for himself. Am, am I willing to, to, to stand for my beliefs, even with all personal consequences attached? Or is it okay to work for the NSA and still be a hacker? Is that possible? I mean, that's the point. And, I mean, the world is changing slowly. Uh, I'm sure more people like the Pirate Bay founders or Julian will be, suffer personal consequences, frankly many, will suffer personal consequences for what they think is right. But history has shown that in the future, most of these people are not heroes, but they are proven right. The majority of people accept that their moral activities were right. And I think we have to live with that. I, I see no, no resolution to that problem. I mean, the only, res the only other way is to give up your beliefs just to avoid personal consequences. What do you do? Well, in, in the movie, there was an argument uh, uh, by the uh, prosecution that uh, they were able to earn perhaps a million dollars per year uh, or something like that uh, uh, because they had a very popular website and they were selling uh, ad space, uh, 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 banner space, uh, which was about $500 uh, for a week. Uh, and they had uh, uh, many websites who wanted to advertise on their page. So the, the argument was that it was a commercial uh, endeavor, project, a commercial project. So uh, uh, that, that was even worse, you know. <laughs> they deserved to die. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I think that uh, our um, education system depends on uh, uh, plenty of free books and software, and that uh, and, and you, you music, free music. And I think that our life in Serbia would be uh, really, really terrible because of the cost of books, uh, software, music, and stuff. And I think that uh, uh, we, we, we are uh, living uh, uh, illegally, perhaps in some aspects. I, I'm not sure that whether I are illegal or not. But I think that, uh, uh, that we depend a lot on, on those uh, uh, free resources. That, uh, I, I, I mean, from the gray area. Yeah, that, that's that's, that's the point. We, 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 we tend to discuss these issues uh, under the aspect legal or illegal. I think we should only consider these aspects under the term legitimate or not. I mean, legal, legal systems and legal judgments can change over time. And it's more important to think what you think is right, how, should, how it should be, not how it is. I mean, if you always stick to it how it is, you will never change anything. You must say, I want it to be this way because I think that's the right way to do it. And the example you gave is wonderful because it's not just Serbia, it's all the universities in Europe, which of course have probably a little less money than they had before, and they are not willing to pay companies like Elsevier anymore uh, to publish journals nobody is reading uh, just, just to make profit out of it. I mean, they start to think about how to distribute um, the works of, of, uh, of their researchers on the net without jeopardizing the reputation system associated to the journals which is important for them. Um, so that everyone can read this information without paying for it, because it is already paid. I mean, we as a community paid it already. So, and most of these journals you can't even buy as, as a non-university, you can't, even if you have the money, you can't buy them. And these are things that have to change from my point of view. Uh, has the formation of this uh, new tech practice some connection with uh, fire, uh, has the formation of this tech practice uh, some connection with the fire party because I can see uh, many same principles here like sharing, sharing, freedom of information and so on. Uh, I, I didn't get the first part, sorry. Yes, yes uh, the formation of this new hierarchy, some connection with the yeah. pirate party. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. In a, in a way, this is all interconnected. Another thing next to the pirate party are the copy mists. You probably heard of them. Uh, a very, very great activity. I mean, they, they went to, to the Swedish state and said, we are a religious community. And copying data is an act, is a divine act. And uh, they were actually accepted as a religious community in Sweden. So, I mean, there are so many different groups around the world promoting basically the same ideas. That's what makes me so confident that society will change over time. Because it's only the CCC hackers or only the hackers in this room who want to change something. That's a futile act. We will not change anything. But because so many different people in, in so many different areas are promoting the same ideas, I'm so sure it will prevail, because, I mean, it's the people that make, uh, uh, that make, uh, uh, basically, in the end, the legal system as well. I remember uh, when I was, when I was uh, st studying, I started to, to protest against uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, Atomar rockets in Germany, and we do sit-ins, and at that time, that was a criminal act. Nowadays, citizens in Germany are protected by the Constitution. So the more people say, no, this is legal, this is legitimate, no, it's legi legitimate and therefore it should be legal, things can change over time. And that's my, my hope and my, yes, I, 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 it's not a question of belief. I'm so sure that everything will develop in this direction. Yes. Okay, no further questions. Thank you very much for your attention.